Has a stranger made you smile lately? Uh, yeah, a stranger's made me smile recently. I was actually at a conference uh, for the uh, BC AFN, uh, BC Assembly of First Nations, and this elder came up to me and he said, hey, you're that rapper from the Squamish Nation, aren't you? And I said, I just smiled and I said, yeah, that's me. <laughs> it was so cute. It was so awesome to be known, I guess, by an elder in that uh, way. <laughs>
but it's so interesting now because I'm just different and unique. Like I get hired for those things I was bullied for. <laughs> like I get hired for the gap in my teeth. I get hired because I'm two-spirited. I get hired because I'm black. I get hired because I'm indigenous. So it's such a weird, weird feeling, but pretty amazing that you can turn that into something unique like that. What risk would you take if you knew you couldn't fail? I think the risk I would take if I knew I couldn't fail is moving from Vancouver, most likely. And it's something that I've been talking about quite a bit because I have dual citizenship to the United States. So just to say that I've done it, like even just moving for like a year, six months to a year, it's something that I, I would love to do. But it's very different down there, just talking to people that live there. Uh, very different from Vancouver, like the healthcare situation. And there's a lot going on down there, but hopefully uh, one day I can do it if possible. And I think the duel is definitely gonna help <laughs> quite a bit. <laughs> what lesson did you learn the hard way? Getting caught for drinking and driving at a very young age, uh, in my early 20s. And it got to a point where my friends were literally like threatening not to be friends with me anymore if I did it. I think I really had to go through that and hear that a few times because I went through like the court system and my license got suspended for a year. And I remember in my first court appearance, luckily I don't have a criminal record because the rules were different back then. I remember being in the courtroom with a guy who had tried to stab his girlfriend. If that wasn't a wake up call um, to change my life, and I've never, I've never done it since. That's why I like working with young people to tell them that story, you know, because it could have happened to anybody, but it's almost like you feel like you're, you can't be hurt or you can't hurt anybody else. You just, you just don't care and you just really want to get out of control and, and drunk. So that's probably one of the worst things I've gone through, but I, I'm glad it happened because it just changed my outlook on life for sure. What is your biggest insecurity? I think a lot of people in the industry that I'm in, especially being in politics, uh, they're very insecure. It's almost like imposter syndrome. Like you don't belong there. You don't belong up on the podium. And especially being a woman in politics. I know a lot of my friends or colleagues that are in politics, they go through that. They're just like, I don't belong here. But it's like, yeah, you do. Like this is what you signed up for. You gotta do it, you know? And sometimes I forget all of my accolades that I've done to get that far. It's almost like people remind me sometimes, they're like, you remember when you, you know, won that award or did this speech? And I'm like, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> I, I did that. Wow. It's good to get reminded about those types of things. But that's probably my biggest insecurity sometimes. What was your greatest heartbreak? When I literally had to run for my life out of a fire. It still trips me out that that happened just over 10 years ago, but having to think so quickly on what to grab and literally like running running for my life and you know losing a bunch of stuff but just w literally watching it go up in flames yeah that was pretty heartbreaking but i think it was almost like a blessing in disguise because i don't know if i'd be where i'm at today but i just i can't put into words how that feels being able to get out of it too without a scratch on me so it was, it was like a heartbreak, but like the best thing that's ever happened to me, like all mixed into one. And the fact that the person who started the fire, I've never really got an apology from them. I know it's because they're lost in their addictions. They actually passed away a few years ago. And I remember hearing the news and I started crying because I felt bad for them. Because it, it was accidental, but it could have been prevented. But she's just so far gone in her addictions because when she was still here, I would see her out and she would just act all normal. You know, I even got apologies from her husband who wasn't even there at the time. But it's just like any normal human being would apologize, even if it was an accident, you know, but I never got that from her. And it hurt. She's at peace now and I am too. I just, I use that story now for like healing, so. Who is the one person that changed your life? That's an easy question to answer. The one person that changed my life was my mom, definitely. A single mom of me and my three siblings. And I just watched her struggle growing up, like working 
anywhere she could. Like she started off on the welfare system, but just totally worked her way up. Like I remember her working at 7-Eleven, A&W, Grouse Mountain. And then she got a job as the First Nations support worker at my elementary school. <laughs> so that was interesting. Sometimes very good, sometimes not so good. <laughs> but she totally turned around her life and retired uh, in that position as well. And she did that for about 30 years. So I think that's where I get my work ethic is from seeing her struggle and just working her way up. Who's your hero? My hero is my sister, for sure. Um, she's basically like a second mom to me because we have 12 years between us. She's 12 years older than me. And she's the director of HR for the Squamish Nation now. And I remember being younger and asking her for a job because everybody else hires their cousins or their sisters. And she said, no, you can apply like everybody else. And she's always had that attitude towards me. But <laughs> she's trying to teach me something. And she's done that for me my whole life. And she just taught me that you can have anything you want just as long as you work hard. Uh, no cutting corners <laughs> and it's so funny with her like if we get into arguments all she'll have to say is that I change your dirty diaper and then I've got nothing else to say to come back to that <laughs> so I'd have to say my sister is my hero what's a belief that you hold that many people may disagree about I would definitely say trans rights uh, something I really believe in uh, because my aunt was trans and it's actually horrifying what's going on for trans people down in the US um, in many of the states they're trying to ban drag which is I just I don't I don't get it I don't understand it and the storytelling like drag storytelling they're trying to cancel that here in Vancouver as well they're saying that it's like sex sexualizing the kids and I'm like it has nothing to it has absolutely nothing to do with that it's like people hiding their hate in different ways. Some people don't believe in that. And I'm just like, it's human rights. Like you believe one thing for one group, but then you're like, oh, I don't agree with that when it comes to trans people. And I look up to trans people so much, like they have it the hardest. And I'm gonna try to use my voice as much as I can to speak up for them. It's really interesting how I'm trying to educate people and things are coming out of people that are very transphobic and I'm just like wow like I had no idea that they thought that way. I think it's really good that these uh, issues are coming to light and people can't hide the way they feel about it anymore so it's it's an exciting time but it's, it's a scary time as well. Try to educate people as much as I can about trans folks. What's something if anything that you feel shame around? I would have to say sometimes I feel shame about not really having a relationship with my father. Um, growing up, he wasn't around too often, and we've kind of been on and off in our relationship. But as soon as COVID hit, he lives in uh, Blaine, Washington, and he almost expected me to like go out to the border and visit him and stuff. And he was really upset that I didn't. And he would just say things like, you know, like not really believing in COVID and like my our political beliefs are kind of different. So I haven't talked to him in a few years, but sometimes I feel shame about that. And it's people are like, you know, you only have one dad, but it's like, it's exhausting having to sit there and listen to those different comments that just totally go against what I think. I miss him sometimes, but it's just like, you know, I'm in politics. I have people breathing down my neck all the time, you know? So it's like, I don't need another person doing that. You know, like, why aren't you coming to visit me? And things like that. Maybe I'll talk to him soon, but I kind of feel shame in that because people make you think, you know, like, you know, you only have one father and you almost have to put up with the disrespect because it's your parent or your, you know, your family. What makes you really, really happy? <laughs> uh, a lot of things make me really happy, but I'd say the number one thing is DJing. There's nothing like playing a song and people are so into it that they literally start cheering and jumping up and down. And sometimes I'll stop in the middle of a gig and I'm just like, wow, I can't believe I do this for a living and I get paid for this. It's to make people happy. And it works, like the effect that people have, like has on people with music. And it's music that I'm picking. You know, I'm not a fan of requests that often or anymore, but it's just, you know, 
something that was feeling in my heart that they would like and they usually do. And it's really cool and people look at me and they smile with their eyes. It's just like, it's worth $10 million. And sometimes I look at the photographs and people catch really good shots because I'm just in my happy place. It feels like everybody disappears and I'm just there like doing a musical experiment and it usually goes pretty well. <laughs>